nice to have you all here at this early hour and in parallel to the keynotes. Um, today, I want to have a discussion with you about automated testing and bot farming. Um, so it's not just me talking, but it's us having a discussion. Um, we're having a microphone, so um, when you have anything to say, just raise your hand. We'll give you the microphone, and then we'll have your, your part on the stream, too, and in the recording. Um, some words about me. I'm Chris. Uh, I'm working at Pengotronics, and Pengotronics mostly does um, software development, but I'm a hardware developer, so I'm working on hardware for embedded Linux testing, basically. Um, and yeah, I've done things like the USB SD marks, and we're a, a team of three at the moment. Um, yeah, if you want to uh, contact me, drop me an email, find me on Twitter or something like that. Um, yeah, maybe a few words about bot farming. We've had some, some talks uh, on this topic already, but just to, to recap what we've already heard. Um, when I'm talking about bot farming, I mean um, we have some devices under test, usually embedded Linux devices, um, that we can control automatically. So we can switch power on and off, we have serial console access, um, we can switch boot mode, stuff like that. Um, and at least when Pengotronics is talking about bot farming, we always mean that we have interactive access onto these devices in our bot farm, because that's our, one of our main use cases. So we have uh, devices in our lab and we can, our colleagues can work from our office or from home uh, using these this devices in the lab, and we can share those devices between developers. Um, and the other part is automated execution of, of stuff, and, and stuff is uh, usually uh, automated testing, I guess. Um, so we can, of course, run tests interactively. Someone has to develop tests and someone has to debug them if they fail. Um, but there's also all this whole area of continuous testing. So um, when you have projects um, that want to um, test a branch that has been pushed in a merge request, um, they build artifacts and they can deploy it on, on a device on a test somewhere. That's, we've heard that in the Collabora talk. Um, they do that quite a lot, um, and, but it's also, on our side, it's usually uh, testing of uh, artifacts that have, we have built. So uh, we are doing nightly builds for our bot support packages, and afterwards uh, they are deployed onto a target and the test suite runs. Those targets in our lab are usually highly specific because we work with customers that build highly specific hardware. Um, so test suits are always tailored for one device on the test uh, in our case, but of course uh, we can also run some generic test suits or something that's specific to a project um, depending on your use case. Yeah, and with that said, um, I want to start with the discussion part of this. Um, if you scan this QR code, uh, you will find the link also in the uh, talk description in the chat platform. Um, there's a Google Docs document, and I invite you all to join there. Um, we will collect uh, topics there, um, and you can rate them with an emoji if you want to upvote them, like on, on GitHub and stuff. And yeah, and then we'll see where the discussion brings us. Still see some smartphones up, so I'll wait before switching the slide. <laughs> yeah, I've prepared some some questions and some initial answers, maybe to, to share a little bit about what we do. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so uh, first um, question here, I'll make this a little bit in a, bigger in a moment. Um, how are you using automated testing? Um, what does your bot farm look like? And especially what has changed in the last two years uh, over the pandemic, uh, or did anything change, or didn't, did that not affect your bot farm at all? Um, well, our bot farm, um, we have like around 100 different devices on the test in our lab, mostly uh, different devices, so sometimes it's two of one of, of a type, but it's usually just different devices. Um, and when we have more than one, we usually share it between interactive use and automated use. So if a developer works uh, on it over day and forgets to unlock it overnight, the automated test, automate test can still run on the other set. And if one of them fails, we still have the other one, what's quite neat too. Um, 
most of our lab is built uh, with, on, on 19 inch server racks and we have seen the Collabora ones with the clean cable management. We've tried that too, but we're really bad at it. <laughs> so those um, racks usually are, are scattered in our office. So every colleague has one in their room or at least in the, the room uh, next to that and everyone can work on it. So if you want to have a device on a test in a lab, you just find a free space, put it there. Um, it's like 16 devices on a test in such rack. Um, and we have a test server in the middle, um, somewhere here in, in that area. And Ethernet switch, um, the older revisions also had a serial server, RS-232 to Ethernet. But we've skipped that in the newer revisions we've built since 2020, I guess. Since they made a lot of trouble uh, because they are not behaving good. And so we've moved our serial ports to USB. Uh, what has a lot of problems too, but at least we know these problems and, and know how to handle them. Um, the older revisions also had a CAN bus on the rack, newer ones don't have that. Um, yeah, that, that's what it looks like. Um, additionally, uh, colleagues have labs on their desk, so they have a power switch and the serial servers sometimes, mostly the serial servers we ripped out of the uh, remote labs uh, recently and they have their desktop PC for, for controlling of USB, for example. And all this is merged together in a, in a large lab grid uh, lab network, so everybody can access every device in, in every position if they want to. Um, what has changed uh, in our lab? So we've built more of them. Um, we've replaced our uh, GPIO infrastructure. So till 2020-ish, we had uh, GPIOs on a one-wire bus that was scattered around that uh, remote lab. Um, and now it's, we've moved that to CAN on a hardware we've built ourselves to make it more robust. So we've got rid of USB in that, that chain. And yeah, we have now all software under our control and can, can work on that. Um, one thing that's, that's really um, used a lot is multiplexing of USB devices. So if you've got a USB thumb drive thingy and you want to simulate automated updates using USB, what some of our customers do in the field, um, you can switch that thumb drive to your host PC, uh, put a new image on there, put it back onto your device on, to your device on the test, and then you can, can simulate an update from there without any, anybody having to uh, interact with that. And yeah, we're still working on our one test server per device on the test concept using our uh, test automation controllers we are building ourselves. But uh, yeah, getting hardware, uh, buying components is hard, so it takes longer than we want to. Yeah, Tim. Are you, uh, are you using your new TAC board to do your USB multiplexing? Um, no, that's, that's still an external device, so okay. that's not in there. Um, yeah, another hand, your first row, I think. Does uh, this server include serial? Uh, the test server includes serial, yes. And power relay as well? Pardon? A power relay. Yeah, and a power relay. So uh, <laughs> we, we want to have like the 80% the case, so it's, we can switch power up to 48 volts, 5 amps, and measure current and voltage there, have serial three USB ports for whatever you want to connect. There's a serial port that has that, some GPOs and a CAN bus for more automation. There's an Ethernet switch in there, so you, you can do VLAN untagging if you want to have your device on a test in another network. So quite a, quite a neat thing. Okay, so um, maybe just um, let, let's continue there. How does your, your lab look like? Does any one of you already do board farming uh, and want to share a little bit of what you're doing, how it looks like? Tim. <laughs> I'm going to talk about my personal lab, not the Sony lab. Well, it, it's a long story. Um, but uh, in my lab, I've got a single PDU that's controlling, that has multiple ports on it. Um, and I've got Sony a couple of years ago did their own debug board that was kind of uh, similar in spirit to the TAC, not exactly, but it's controlled over USB and actually you send it commands over a USB serial thing and it, it does things like control GPIOs and do USB multiplexing and mm. it also does uh, power measurement and power control. Um, so, but the problem is it's custom hardware and it's dated, right? It hasn't been updated for a while. 
Um, but I'm really interested in what specific uh, like PDUs people are using. Um, I know uh, someone mentioned yesterday the uh, Sonos or uh, I can't remember the yeah the so the Wi-Fi the uh, Wi-Fi controller that yeah. that seems pretty interesting and easy to use. Uh, but that's my lab. Uh, I don't know. I actually don't have that much. Almost all of my serial stuff is USB. I have a uh, my USB hubs are way overloaded, mm -hmm. and uh, I know you guys talked about it in a previous conference that USB is quite flaky, and that's been my experience as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Over there. Hi. Yep. In uh, in our lab, we're also seeing some of the USB issues that you're seeing, and we're really trying hard to get away from a one-to-one -one setup because right now we're using. Uh, basically a sidekick device like a Raspberry Pi or some other controller and going directly through there to avoid some of the USB multiplexing issues. So if we could talk more about some of the USB issues that you're seeing, that would be really helpful to me. Yeah. Would anybody find with USB? Hmm? I was wondering if anybody is having no issue with USB. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, it, works. Um, it works when you have one board. Yeah, <laughs> but but even if you're just having one board, we've seen issues where like USB serial adapters just uh, stop to work yeah. after weeks or months of working. So uh, w what we've done with our test automation controller is you can switch every USB port on and off, actually. So you can just power cycle your USB devices to work around that. Oh. Um, so um, what what PDUs are we using, Tim? Was your question? Um, yeah. We've got one. Is hidden here. That's the, the large one. It's 24 ports, and it's a, a Gude, it's a German manufacturer, I think, 8080. Um, yeah, has 24 outlets. You can switch it to you via Ethernet. You've got power measurement for like eight uh, ports in a row, so you can uh, control what's going on there. Yeah. But that PDU, it switches at uh, 230 volt, I guess. Yeah, it's so you still to lots of uh, wall warts plugged in for that. Yeah, uh, so we we have oh, maybe we can even see that. No, not not really. So we, there are cables coming out of this PDU and going to to every device on the test, and the um, yeah uh, PDUs are just there. Do you also use a low voltage uh, distribution somewhere? Uh, not. I'm, at I'm the running moment. my board form of twelve boards from uh, ATX power supply. Yeah, and I run. The, the two bigger bone blacks that are controlling it from the five volt standby power. Mm -hmm. So that's I just neat. have one power supply and I don't need all the, yeah. the bricks there. Mm, that doesn't work for us because our customers all do their own thing in regards of power supply. So some are five volts, some are like uh, 48 volts. So we stick to the wall watts. Yeah, so I do something, something similar to what you have, except I just took an old uh, laptop power supply. Um, I've got a couple different setups of about four boards each in my own home lab just for me so I don't have the, the, the complicated needs that, that are here. But I just take that, uh, it's a 12 volt power supply. I just use a uh, just a power relay, uh, a power distribution board, and then a, a, a four port relay board with an ESP on it, ESP something or other, 8266 or something running Tasmoda. Combination of that with MQTT and Home Assistant gives me kind of a web UI it's not great, but it's there. But that's one of the things, you know, I'm excited about LabGrid. I really want to get that integrated. But what I would love to see next is some kind of web front end for all that so that I could just have, you know, different tabs for each of my boards with, you know, on off switches, you know, on the left hand side for yeah. the USB or the serial console and that kind of thing. If, if there's anybody that has recommendations on what kind of web frameworks and things to use for somebody who knows nothing about web design, I would love to hear that. Yeah, uh, LabGrid has support for those MQTT Tasmota switches uh, integrated, not using Home Assistant, but uh, directly on MQTT. Sure. Yeah. yeah. That's the next step for me when I get home. I didn't even, I'd not heard about LabGrid until this week. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I hacked up some small Perl script which implements a web server, and since all controls to the boards are shell scripts, I. I just launch the shell script from the web server when you press the button in the web UI. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I think there was a hand over there in the back. Yes. Thank you. 
so I work for TI, and we have around 40 racks in Dallas, and another, we are growing to around 80 racks in India. So pretty large setup from our yeah. side. Each of the racks have around 16, 20 ports on an average, um, close to 200 to 300 ports overall in the system, distributed all over the place. Uh, we use an ancient system called OpenTest, and we are considering about moving to LabGrid. Some of the challenges that we have had is um, uh, time-sensitive network testing, okay. um, camera testing, um, display, uh, interactive remote uh, verification testing. Yeah. If there are techniques for us to uh, interact from that perspective, that'll be interesting for us. Yeah. So uh, everything that's a camera or HID devices is still a problem for us. So. Uh, when it comes to everything, graphics or x86 user input, uh, we are just still doing that on our desk. So there is nothing we have to work on that remote, but maybe anyone else has a solution? Uh, Tim? So I've talked about this a lot, so I feel bad bringing it up, but uh, I've been working on a project for the last two years to do hardware testing, and it includes APIs for um, video and camera capture. It's not streaming though, so it's not live. So what you do is you, like if you're trying to see what's going on during boot, you can uh, have an external camera that you control that watches the, the display of the device and saves that to an output. And then you have to post-process that output to look at it either with a human or mm -hmm. uh, haven't really got to the part where I try to automate analysis of that display for things. Uh, so, I mean, there's work in progress, but it's not, it's not ready for prime time yet. Yeah. So. I, I can imagine having uh, uh, some, some way to automatically look at what you've captured could be interesting for, for testing in the end, yeah. Yeah, yeah for the uh, x86 case, we have something uh, that's working nicely. Uh, we, um, we evaluated multiple solutions. Uh, there are uh, like KVM switches that can capture the HDMI signal or VGA signal. They can uh, produce keyboard input to the device. They can plug USB devices into the into our board. So actually, we are able to power switch with a normal uh, switchable power lane. Uh, we can switch it on and off. We can go into the BIOS. We can change the BIOS settings. Everything is captured via um, HDMI. Uh, so that's like operating the device from locally and there are several vendors on the market and actually and one very interesting open source project it's called pi kvm mm -hmm. and actually it was one of those who performed the best okay but yeah. our manager wanted to have a commercial solution actually because i think he was afraid that we would start hacking on pi kvm during work <laughs> okay Um, yeah, just a, just a side note to the uh, capturing um, displays. I have a, a really, really little pet project. It's called Pico CAFOM. It's a bit smaller than Pi CAFOM and just uses a HDMI USB grabber and um, a small USB uh, HDI simulator. It's on GitHub. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a pet project, bad code in there, but we can have a look at that. Yeah. Uh, maybe you can, can drop the link into our notes, then yeah. we'll come find that. Okay, um, I've got one more here in front. And maybe having a look at the clock, we should go to the next topic. It's 10.30. Uh, years ago, there was a project called STB Tester that did basically capturing HDMI and, or even LVDS, I think, and then analyzing the outputs. But I don't know what came of it. I just heard it here from ELC. I never heard of it again. <laughs> okay. Anybody? Uh, related to ST, uh, network uh, testing concern, uh, it is the next thing to we are working on. Uh, we spent last week to extend LightGrid to uh, add network testing support so we can export network devices and integrate it into LightGrid as uh, abstraction, kind of abstraction. and. Uh, my personal goal was to be able to test uh, switches, the SAT driver, drivers and so on, but uh, well, uh, time sensitive networking PTP and so on, it can, can be added on top of this work as well. OK, 
Okay. Uh, maybe the question with the next most rockets is, um, do you have any new control gadgets? Anything you want to share that you've bought and think is really cool, even if it's maybe simple? Um, so, because simple things can help a lot. Um, I don't know if those are really new, uh, but we use, we use iCush devices to um, uh, replug, unplug and replug USB cables remotely. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty useful because in our lab we have a lot of Chromebooks and we do pretty much everything over USB. Uh, we switch power on and off and we also access the consoles from there. Mm -hmm. And since USB are very buggy in our lab as well, yeah. it's really useful to have something to just uh, unplug and replug remotely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, YK U R S H. It's already here, or I can add it if it's. Uh, uh, oh yeah, it's there. Yeah, the Wacosh. Yeah. yeah. Um, so two things I've learned about USB that's helpful for our farm is um, it's much better to have a wide topology of USB devices than the deep one because. If you chain USB devices, if one of the ports decides to reset, it affects everything downstream from that. Um, also, in Sysbus USB, you'll often find an authorized file. And if you write zero to it, it'll tell Linux to uh, unbind all the devices attached to that maybe herbal or downstream device. Um, and that's a good way to kind of, I find, between board users, kind of unloading the devices, putting them back on. Mm -hmm. And that has the effect as well. If, if someone has a file handle open to, say, a, a USB serial console, it will kick them off. Yeah. Um, and that's quite a nice way to kind of reset um, USB devices as well. Okay. Um, and also buying good quality hubs makes a difference as well. Yeah. Um, because of the whole USB devices um, power cycling problem, we actually got a patch into a recent kernel where you can disable individual ports and the USB device won't come back until you re-enable the port. So if you have a newer kernel, then there's a new SysFS file you can use for that, which also works reliably. And it switches off power if the USB hub supports switching off power. Yeah, right. So we still have to uh, adapt the uh, U-Hub control for that, yeah. I guess. So, but yeah, the kernel already supports it. Just a follow-up question to that. Uh, just a follow-up question to that. Is it possible possible to power toggle from yeah. inside? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, your USB hub has to support it. They need to switch for that. But um, the U-Hub control GitHub has a list of uh, hubs that do that. That's quite a good resource to find them. Okay, um, I'll move on to the next uh, most rocket uh, question here. Um, the question is, is it possible to test hardware features this way? Um, I would say, yeah, definitely we can test hardware features. That's, that's what we are all doing. So we want to test the software um, we have for the bots, for the devices under test, and we want to test hardware features too. So we try to connect um, the um, uh, all hardware that's around a, a CPU and test that. Um, if you want to test uh, uh, secure and encrypted boot and stuff like that, uh, you have to steer your device on the test through those states so that you set it up for a test. Um, in LabGrid, there's a thing called a strategy you can write for a board, and that's a state machine that describes how you move, uh, how, how you uh, uh, configure a board between these different steps. Um, yeah, but basically everything you can do by hand is, is possible automated too. Um, I'm not sure, uh, I'm looking to the Pangotronics guys, have we done that? Have we tested a secure boot and if we can break it, Ruben? Yeah, so we did secure boot testing for one of our projects and um, you basically have to use the vendor APIs to find out whether your board is in the correct state and then you have to write tests which try to break secure boot in that case. And that can totally be done. And we also implemented this to um, verify that our app armor profiles used in that um, project also worked and that worked out fine. OK, 
Okay, next most rockets, I think, is um, this question here. Uh, which existing test suits are you using? So um, on our end, we are usually using um, like um, tests we've written for a specific device on the test for a specific customer. So we share some test cases between all of them, uh, like health checks from time to time and basic things for the user space, but it's mostly very individual. Um, and we're wondering if anybody's using like a case health test or test suite it's built into other software projects on their side on a regular basis. I think Collabora does that um, very heavily. Um, but um, for the other ones having uh, labs or running labs, do you use those test suits and when, how do you use them? So from TI at least, we kind of forked from LTP and we created our LTP TDT. And there is um, uh, a target based test, which is the device driver test. And we have something called a VATF, which is the host site. For example, when you're doing PCI enumeration or USB, DFU testing, for example. So that's the combination that we, are, we have been working with. We haven't found anything in upstream that we can contribute back to, uh, which we can probably share with the um, rest of the community here. So it's a forked out tree that is uh, essentially TI specific right now. Mm -hmm. I was working with a Linux uh, testing framework for some time, uh, but uh, it is uh, hard to integrate into uh, actual uh, targets which we should test as a device for production. I mean, you can't uh, integrate uh, all of needed scripts and software into uh, end software, and uh, it is affecting testing results, so uh, probably all of testing which uh, should be done at the end is kind of uh, outside of the scope of most of testing frameworks which exist. Okay, I see no other hand. Um, having a look, what's the next question? Um, maybe Tim's? Tim had three rockets here. Um, uh, is anyone doing hardware testing in the lab? What, what kind of hardware testing do you mean? Well, I, so uh, the ones that I focused on were audio uh, and uh, serial port off the board. So using instead of doing loopback testing, which almost everybody does to test uh, like Linux drivers, I, want, <coughs> I wanted to test all the way through the through the hardware, and so. Uh, my pet project is lab control, and I'm working on uh, APIs to control uh, hardware in your lab that's not on your device under test, so that you can capture, for instance, for a serial port test, capture uh, another device that's connected by a cable to your device under test, and then analyze the data there. And uh, uh, so the, we've done a couple of different things, you know, I, I mentioned before the video and the camera and audio and serial are the ones we've done so far. But I'm wondering if any other, anybody else is doing things like that where they're manipulating external uh, pieces of hardware and how they're doing that, if it's just all ad hoc scripts or if they have a, a framework set up for that. That's my question. I don't know if that really is the question, but uh, often uh, to test the software, actually, because it's almost always a point to test the software, uh, you need some additional hardware to really test the interaction, right? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, <laughs> I think that's a given uh, for, I mean, when it's for uh, customer software, I mean, that, that is in the end going to be uh, deployed as a product. There's almost always something else that you need to interact with. Yeah, and it's like, like like Bluetooth uh, right. client or or uh, uh, Wi-Fi uh, access points or something like that. I guess my question is, what are what are people doing now when they're doing that type of testing? Are they just using their own scripts? Are there any other frameworks that do that? Or 
<laughs> what I'm missing a bit is a kind of management of the the other device you need. Like right. like for uh, a Bluetooth test, you have you, you don't have a Bluetooth device for every device on a test in your in your lab. So you have one or well, maybe two devices there. Uh, so you when in in your lab grid or whatever management thing, you need to allocate both the device on a test and a another device depending on a test. And that's something that is missing at the moment. And you, you have to coordinate that not multiple devices on test are using the same Bluetooth thingy that you're using in a yeah. test at the moment, yeah. Yeah, so for LabGrid, we actually support audio capture, so you can get audio traces either like developing live and stream them to your computer or record them and then do analysis afterwards. And for Wi-Fi and Bluetooth testing, we just used to put a Wi-Fi and Bluetooth router on top of the, the racks. Okay. Okay. I'm not. I'm not going to the <laughs> coffee break. So thank you. Um, um, so for Bluetooth and Wi-Fi testing, we actually put a Bluetooth uh, a Wi-Fi router with Open VRT or Open WRT on top of our racks, and um, it also has a USB Bluetooth adapter and just sends out discovery messages. So you can at least test scanning for every device in the rack, and you can test like whether Wi-Fi scanning and connection to the Wi-Fi works. But we don't really have a solution on how to control the, the OpenWRT router at the moment. Yeah. You, you could add it as another resource in your app test, but I think we're not doing really that really. Um, so uh, LabGrid has support for controlling USB Wi-Fi sticks and USB Ethernet um, devices via um, Network Manager. So you can connect to an access point hosted by the device and also start an access point so the device can connect to that. You can basically test yeah, iperf and network traffic over that device. So when it comes to Wi-Fi testing, personally, I do a lot of manual testing because uh, I'm working a lot with drivers. Um, and in that case, I'm using quite a nice box called PC Engines. And this box, it has two mini PCI Express slots. And in there, you can put uh, two 11AC or 11AX cards. I actually haven't found an 11AX card that works <laughs> yet, but uh, uh, at least for 11AC cards, then you can run post APD on your host. And host APD has this Unix domain socket control interface that you can use. So I haven't used LabGrid, but if I'm going to check that out, then I will see if I can also hook the PC engines into that so that I can manipulate the host APD control dynamically for things like uh, switching channels on the fly and things like that. Um, if anyone is doing something similar, then we can talk afterwards. Here at the front. Well, this is not what I do, but I think it's pretty obvious. I think what we need from LabGrid is because it's not a matter of having a very specific support for Wi-Fi, for Bluetooth or USB. That's what Tim is ex really need, and I guess all those that said something here is we need a way to control multiple places in LabGrid. For, because right now, when you write a test case for LabGrid, you you have an implicit place as a target. No, no you can have multiple. You can have multiple places yeah. because that that basically is the tool here. We we, it's not a matter of having generic support for a lot of stuff because a lot of the time this is very custom stuff. So we need to just use uh, multiple places and do normal uh, lab grid control of those. Then you can do it anything. I guess. Yeah. And there is this uh, reservation method in lab grid, so you could wait for a specific place to appear or to be available, and then you could like control your access point using lab grid when it's available, and then start to test suit. Yeah. So the, the, the thing was we have to be able to wait for multiple places what that's supported in that project. <laughs> okay, um, it's like five minutes. So um, maybe going down the list a little further. Um, one question is, is there any group for discussion this further? Um, it would be great to keep talking to everyone after this meeting. And Tim has added the eLinux automated testing page and board farm page, I guess. Um, that's a great place to start and there's a mailing list 
And there's the monthly automated uh, testing call, I think it's, yeah. it's called. Yeah, it always collides with another meeting I have, so I'm <laughs> not there that often. So yeah, I guess that's, that's good places to, to continue the discussion. Uh, anyone has anything else that I've missed? Okay. Um, then Bastian from Remote uh, Questions. Um, does anyone have experiences with automated repeated tasks, maybe like automated Git bisecting? Um, my first idea would be to use LabGrid scripting for that. You can use uh, LabGrid as a library in Python and then you can um, write a small wrapper that does your Git bisect using LabGrid. But um, I'm, I'm more the electronics engineer, so I'm looking to my colleagues, are we actually using that that way? Alexei. Usually as a kernel developer and uh, some uh, user of Libgrid, uh, if I have some bugs, uh, then I use git bisect exec and execute uh, actual Libgrid uh, tests which trigger this particular bug. So uh, probably I didn't understand the question, what is actual problem? <laughs> So I think what the actual problem or what the question is about is um, if you detect that your test suite um, fails for whatever reason, maybe because you updated your BSP and now there's bug in there somewhere, you could try to automatically roll back or start a git bisect session on the BSP to find out what the buggy commit was, right? And there's no real automation for that yet, as far as I know, because you have to hook back into the build system to roll back to a specific revision and there's at the moment at least and uh, I don't think we have planned any of that yet any connection between LabGrid and the build system itself so it would require external scripting at the moment. Um, kernel CI has automated bisection integrated as part of the CI so that could be uh, worth looking at as a reference implementation. I'm not sure if it works only on the Lava Labs at the moment. Uh, it doesn't matter what the lab is, right? Because it just submits jobs. If it fails, it bisects and submits another job. So it could be with lab grid. Oh, don't throw your laptop away. Uh, it could be with, with anything, really. But it's it's a bit outside of the board form, right? From your board form, you just want to know, does this build work? and then you can decide whether you bisect or do anything else. Okay, it's like two more minutes. Um, anything else you want to add? Or I'll pick another question. <laughs> okay, um, maybe one that we can answer in time is uh, what software do people use to manage access uh, to boards, uh, e.g. LabGrid, um, and how many homegrown systems are there? So may maybe um, a show of hands, um, who uses something like LabGrid in their labs? Quite a few hands. Um, something like LabGrid or LabGrid? <laughs> let's, let's say LabGrid. Um, who has a Lava Lab? Quite a few other hands. Fuego? <laughs> well, oh. Fuego is the test engine. I, yeah. Underneath the engine I'm using is called TPC. And it's been uh, open source for 15 years, but nobody uses it but me. So okay. it's, a, it's essentially a custom. Yeah. Um, what else do you use? Test infra. Pardon? Test infra. Test infra. Yeah. OK. Oh, test infra. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, your own scripts, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good question. Uh, how, how many are using a, a homegrown solution that's not something public? Okay, yeah, that's like another third or a fourth, I guess. And there's a hand, last question. Or? Okay. <laughs> okay, I guess. Um, we're done. Thank you very much. Uh,
It was, was great to have you all here, and I guess we'll hear on the next, next automated testing uh, monthly call or something like that. Yeah. <laughs>